Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel and spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, this is a little bit of an impromptu uh, video. Actually, this is take two of this video because, well, I didn't put the SD card in this little bad boy. So to make sure my audio is up to my standards, uh, we're going to do it again, which I'm not upset about because, well, first of all, these wines are fantastic. All right, so a little background. Today is March 21st, so last night. Had some dinner with some friends. Uh, one of the guys was like, hey, you remember that wine I bought? This one here, the Petite Mouton? Um, I'm, let's, uh, let's have it. Let's, let's open it up and drink it. All right. We figured out a day, which ended up being yesterday. And we went to a restaurant where we know we could bring uh, bottles. And the reason is in Texas, if you actually have liquor spirits on your license at a restaurant, you can't, uh, uh, people are not allowed to bring in alcohol. Um, if you only serve beer or wine, then yes, people can bring in beer or wines. I guess you can bring spirits. Or if you have no license at all, you totally can do that. So we figured out a place where we could do that. And he brought this, but he also decided to bring the Sasakaya. So he decanted them Yesterday morning, around 8, 9 o'clock, he put them in a decanter, let them decant all day, and then brought them to the restaurant. I was like, well, I know we're going to have Thai food, so Riesling, perfect pairing for most Asian fare. So I brought this one, and then the other person who joined us, there was supposed to be one more, but he didn't show. The other person brought um, a half bottle of a killer wine, and I'll talk about that in just a second. All right, first, let's talk about each of the wines real briefly. Uh, so the first one is 2016 Donhoff. This is the uh, Kruznacher Krotenfull Riesling Cabinet. So um, the thing about this is if it was just uh, Kruznacher, I said Kruz? Yeah, Kruznacher Krotenfull, it would be what we call a Grosses Gewex or a Great Growth or a a Grand Cru, effectively. But because it was harvested in a way and the wine was made in a way where it has a decent amount of residual sugar, and it's not super sweet, but it's like just kind of a fruity style. But because of that, it loses its Grand Cru status. It still means it's an excellent wine. Um, it's definitely uh, what we call a Grosselaga type of level of vineyard. It's a single vineyard. It's 100% Riesling. Fantastic stuff. If you've been watching my show for quite a while, you know back in 2019, I visited Germany and I visited uh, Donhoff and even uh, Ann Donhoff sat down with me. We had a great interview. She pulled out, I don't know, like 12 to 13, I don't know, a lot of wines. Even had somebody join us on camera. So um, so yeah, that's the that's, and they're in the Naha, or it looks like Nahe, N-A-H-E, but the Naha part of Germany and fantastic stuff. They're one of the best wine producers in Germany, and definitely I would call them the best in the Naha. All right, uh, the next line, next wine up is the 2019 Sasakai from Tenuta Sanguido. This is considered like the first Super Tuscan. It was created in 1968, and uh, this is an attempt by uh, these guys and other people that followed to kind of break the rules. They wanted to use things that were not native to Italy as far as grapes, so we call them the international varieties. In reality, they're basically French. So things like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, uh, Syrah, those types of things. It gives them a little more um, flexibility than they sometimes mix it in with Sangiovese or other native Italian grapes. As a result, it's normally in what we call an IGT, which is the uh, Indicazione Geografica Tipica, or the P is, uh, I can't remember the P is, a Protezione or something like that. Protetica, I think that's what the P is. Um, these guys actually have their own DOC or appellation, like next level up. It's the Bulgari Sasakaya. And uh, it states that it has to be at least 80% Cabernet Sauvignon and no more than 20% uh, any other variety that's, uh, that's, is Tuscan, whatever, like is applicable to Tuscany. In reality, it's Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, it's 85% Cab Sauv, 
15 cap franc and it basically never changes. All right. Um, this last one. Oh, so this one sells for a 25 to $30. This one sells for around 300. Um, and then this one here, this is the 2019 Le Petit Mouton des Moutons Rothschild or Rothschild. Uh, this is the second label of Chateau Mouton Rothschild or Rothschild, however you want to pronounce it. They are, we call a first growth in Bordeaux. Their kind of big thing is they were promoted from a second growth to a first growth in 1973. That was a big deal because nobody prior and nobody since has moved up in the ranks. Then again, nobody's actually moved down in the ranks in the 1855 Bordeaux classification. Um, the Baron like lobbied for decades for this to happen and finally got his way in 1973. Um, this is uh, this particular bottle um, as a second growth doesn't command the same price as the first growth. Uh, it sells or I, this this person the person who brought this did buy this one for me. I don't think he bought this one for me. I think he bought it elsewhere. But this one sells for sells for two eighty five. You can find it for maybe as cheap as maybe two fifty some places in the country and as high as around three hundred. Kind of depends on where you're at in the country and all that kind of stuff. We had a fourth wine, which I have a picture up, I should right now, 1984 Lafitte, uh, uh, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, the other Rothschild, or I was, Mouton's probably the other Rothschild, I guess. They're both related. They're, they're like cousins. Um, that one was in the half bottle, and a full bottle for that sold for around $100 to $120 back in the day. So a half bottle probably would have been about 50 or so, um, maybe a little more. I don't know what half bottles were priced at back in the 80s. Um, usually half bottles are 60%, almost two thirds of what a full bottle is now. So it was, it was under 100 or maybe close to 100 if it was the full was selling for more than 100. A full bottle right now, current release sells for around uh, seven to eight hundred dollars. I actually thought it would be higher, but um, that's what I looked at. And the current 1984, when you look it up for a full bottle, sells for about five hundred. Now you may look, you may find, you may hear people say, "Oh, that's like a six thousand dollar bottle of wine." Eh, no, it's not. Um, Vivino is probably where you got it at. And this is one of the things I do not like about Vivino is their prices are wildly out of whack. And the one that I found was in pounds. Now we're not talking pesos of dollars, you know, pounds of dollars are fairly close, but where someone put six or 7,000 pounds for the 84 Lafitte in a full bottle, I don't know. Everywhere else I found Wine Searcher, which is way more reliable because they actually are telling you where you can buy it. Um, closer to 500, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but it might be closer to 600, five to $600, half bottle, figure, three to $400 for a half bottle for the 84 as of right now. Still fantastic. Um, it's definitely not cheap. You know, it, it increased in value. I'll tell you that wine was honestly of the reds, the star of the show. It kind of was just, I mean, it was, it was great. The white wine was the star of the show for me totally uh, as far as the uh, cuisine we were doing. So we went to, like I said, a Thai restaurant. I don't know if I said it was Thai, but a Thai restaurant. All right. So let's go, let's, uh, let's taste the wines real quick. Uh, these actually should be now at a perfect serving temperature. I pulled them out quite a while ago from the fridge and only poured basically a half glass of these and a full glass of this because that's all that was left over. There's a little bit left over in these. That was by design. The person who brought them wanted me to take them home. He actually said, I want to see a video, which is the whole reason I'm doing the video. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done one. All right, so let's taste it. Let's smell it. Well, first of all, color. Um, I got the green screen going, so you, if I put it over here, um, it, so if I put it over here, you won't necessarily see the wine as much. Um, but if I have it here in front of the, in front of the shirt, uh, you might you know, make sure you can actually see it behind the bottles. You might uh, be able to see it has a little bit of a green gold color. Um, so that it's so a 2016. So it's probably been oxidizing a little bit. Um, it doesn't smell oxidized when I, when I smelled it. I mean, maybe a little developing, uh, but it, the first thing that pops out is those, the, the petroleum type thing. So petrol, um, uh, plastic pool toy, shower curtain, even like wax, um, like wax animal at the, at the, at the zoo when it was like super hot, like it just comes out of the machine. I don't know. Do they still have those at the zoo? I don't know. They did when I was a kid in the seventies. Yeah, I know the seventies. Um, but it has all that. It has like the fruit cup thing going on. You got like the, the white grape, a little bit of red cherry, got some peach mango. There's mangoes in this thing. 
little pear. And also it's just got like kind of that wet rock, almost like you just hose down some concrete with some, with some water and just, yeah, um, let's get on the palate. On the palate, it just kind of completes all that. So everything I just said on the nose is there. Add in a little bit of ginger, a little bit of honey. There might be a touch of botrytis with this. That's not common necessarily with cabinet level when we're getting into the higher things like truck and barren oslesia and barren oslesia because they're much later harvest. That's what those mean effectively. There's more likely to have the botrytis, which is that fungus that infects the grapes and it kind of dehydrates them. So you get the higher concentration of sugars and you can kind of get this honey or ginger characteristic. Um, you can get it even in an Auslese, which is the next level down from Baron Auslese. Cabinet Spätlese, probably not present. It could be, but it's not something that I would particularly look for. Um, but because it's just, just a touch sweet, I know this is not going to be anything above really a Spätlese. You can make Auslese in this sweetness level, but it's usually sweeter, but absolutely gorgeous. And this is the perfect wine for anything that has a little bit of spice to it. So Asian food, particularly um, Mexican or Latin food, you know, Latin food. So whether it's Mexico or Central America, South America, if it's got some like pepper type of spice or heat to it. Perfect for like buffalo wings. Oh, I love Riesling and buffalo wings. You know, that type of stuff. Cajun food. Um, yeah, anything that's got some spice to it, a little bit of heat. The sugar in this, it's not a ton. I'll have to look it up. It's probably closer to 20, 25 grams, maybe 30 per liter. I don't know. Um, it's definitely above 10. I'll put it that way. Um, but that helps tame the heat a little bit. And just all the other flavors, especially if you're doing Asian food because they use ginger and all these kind of exotic spices sometimes, um, it plays really well with Riesling. Uh, even if you did Middle Eastern stuff, again, with the spices on there, it doesn't necessarily be hot spicy, but the spices they use in there. And then like classic in Germany, uh, bratwurst, like sausages, uh, go great with Riesling. So yeah, and of course, any of the other usual stuff you pair white wines with. All right, Sasakaya. Uh, Color-wise, um, it's, it's pretty a deep color. Now, I've drank a little bit. <laughs> I drank kind of a lot of this already. Um, but there's a just the touch, the smallest bit of rim variation. But for the most part, it's pretty solid red all the way throughout, more like a ruby. Uh, and it was like a medium on the, on the staining. And so last night, I had a hard time with the red wines on the aromatics. The white wine was perfect because it was Riesling. It's really aromatic. But this one, I get like really like lots of red and black fruit. And actually right now I get a little more cherry, which I wasn't getting it just a little while ago, but raspberry, blackberry, but it's also kind of wrapped in leather. So you've got that earthiness in there, almost like leather and dirt where, where it was like wrapped in with, with, the, uh, with the fruit, kind of like a bacon wrapped steak. The other stuff wraps the fruit. So it's like a good balance between the two. I actually get some little bit of red flowers. I wasn't getting it before but they're, they're fresh in nature and definitely vanilla. So this does sit in French oak. It was about, um, I think it was 50% new. And then, uh, and then the rest were first and second use. It might be a little bit high. My thing was close. It was two thirds new French oak. And then, then the rest is first and second use and it's for 24 months that it's aged in. But you've got that vanilla, you've got that cinnamon, not quite cinnamon, but clove, you've got some baking spices. You've got, you've got really that, almost also that, that, that um, creaminess to it, almost like a whipped cream. Like it's like, a, it's like you're, you know, it's like a pie. So it's new world in many ways, but the earthiness, that leather, the, even the floral stuff was, it's fresh, but that florality and the dirt and the leather really helps help you go, hey, this is probably um, an old world wine in a new world style. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And really what, what solidifies that old world thing is those second and tertiary flavors, especially, are very prominent. It's not like, oh, it's a hint of these things. Like it's there. It's, it's a great balance of fruit and earth. And that is a lot of times for me, an indicator that it might be actually old world rather than just straight up new world because new world tends to be just straight fruit. All right, moving on to the Mouton. Now this is like absolutely just all the way to the edge, 
deep ruby, deep red color, medium staining on the glass. And this is like, the complexity for me is higher as far as the nose and in the palette also. This was, so the Lafitte was my favorite. This was my second favorite. And this was my third favorite. I'll kind of go over that in a little bit. Of course, the white wine was the star of the show, honestly, for, for the pairing. But the Lafitte was the star of the show for the red wines. But this was just absolutely gorgeous. So you've got a really great balance on the nose with the red and black fruits, more like black fruit. So we got blackberry, black plum. This is a 68 Cabernet Sauvignon, 32% Merlot blend. That may change from year to year. Uh, it's 18 months in 50% French, and then the rest is, uh, I think, first and second use. So you get more dried fl florals on the nose and the palate. You're getting more black fruit, cassis, blackberry, black plum, um, combined with like, like forest floor a little bit. So not just dirt, but a little forest floor, uh, a more of a potpourri type of thing going on here, but it's more red and, and violet, uh, f uh, floral type of things. You get, you get even more tobacco. This is like brown tobacco, like really like cigar. Um, so it, it's, I mean, these are both Cabernet Sauvignon based wines. Okay. So this is why they're going to be similarity, but this is not as fruit forward with it. However, I'll make, I'll make a note. This is eight and a half percent alcohol. This is 13. I'm sorry. This is 14. It's 13 and a half. I thought this was closer to 14, five last night. I'm usually not off that much on alcohol. I thought this was 14 and it is this one. I didn't make a call the Lafitte. I was like, it's probably 12 and a half, maybe 13 tops, but probably 12 and a half. And I was right. The, the label said 11.2 to 12.5. So 12.5. Yeah. It, you know, and plus historically it should really shouldn't have been above 12.5. So it was more about knowing the wine. It's your theory going on there for all of you sommeliers studying for an exam. Like me. But yeah, and you've got some, you've, you've got a little bit of green to it, a little bit of mint. So the pyrazine is coming through Uh fern. It's not full on like bell pepper. Because, I mean, it's 19. 19 was not a cool year. It wasn't as hot as 18, but it still was easily to ripe everything. That's why I really think it's close. I mean, I know the label says 13.5, but it tastes ripe. But it's so integrated with, with the earth, the earthiness and the secondary and tertiary flavors that it's like unmistakably uh, European. It's unmistakably Bordeaux. But that's the only critique I have of this particular wine is that the alcohol is noticeable, whereas the alcohol is not noticeable to me in the Sasakaya, even though it's a higher alcohol. And the alcohol was like totally in line on the other one. And this is so low, it's like whatever. Um, but yeah, this is my only critique on it. But yeah, uh, the Lafitte was just absolutely perfect. It had, of course, it was old, 38 years old, so it should have a lot of those secondary and tertiary, so lots of earthiness to it, but the, and the fruit was a little more dried out, but it still was present. It still drank beautifully. A half bottle that's 38 years old, half bottles age much faster than full bottles. I'm not sure if it's a direct linear progression where it's half, well, I'm sorry, it, it um, ages twice as fast, but it ages much faster. So in reality, that was theoretically could have been the equivalent of, we'll just say it was a 40 year old bottle of wine. It was drinking like a 50 or 60 year old bottle. Maybe, I don't know. I don't have experience in drinking Bordeaux past that age. That was one of the oldest, that was the oldest red Bordeaux I've ever had. Uh, it was on one year off from the oldest white Bordeaux I had. And that white Bordeaux was not stored properly the whole time. So it was more oxidized, but it was still beautiful. I also wasn't it wasn't, you know, a, a, a wasn't a, a first growth, it, but it was a iconic white Bordeaux producer. But yeah, um, so yeah, the Lafitte for me was the star of the show. Period of the wines, um, and then this was my second favorite. It's my third. If I was gonna rank them, it would be like I'm not saying I know I said perfect, but we'll say we'll say the Lafitte was a ten. This was like a nine and a half. And it was a nine point four. I mean, they're equivalent in many people's eyes. This was just in its own class. Um, and I think it was perfect with the cuisine we had. Uh, but like we had some drunken noodles and this mouton went great with that. The, the noodles had a little bit of spice characteristic, a little bit of heat. And this really picked it up really well. The alcohol actually 
worked well with it. Sometimes if you drink high alcohol wines with spicy food, it, it gets really disjointed and it makes the spiciness really like unbearable, but it worked, it played really well with it. Um, this was outstanding with, uh, we had a steak salad with it. Uh, the Lafitte was great with the steak salad. Uh, the dumplings, the Lafitte was great with the dumplings. This was great with the dumplings. Um, we had some, we had some uh, vegetables. We had some uh, chicken satay, which of course this was great, but both of the reds played really well with the chicken satay. So we had like a cool like variety of things that were going on. We even had some sticky rice, which I hate coconut. And uh, I don't like, I can't really detect coconut and dill a lot of times from American oak, but this sticky rice was more suntan lotion. And the person who ordered it looked at me and says, do you like it? I'm like, yeah. And then they smiled. I'm like, okay, me it says coconut. Cause I already had got the tropicalness of it. Um, so I was like, oh, well, I don't really taste the coconut. So we're good. <laughs> and it has some mango with it. It was so good. Of course, this went really, really good with that or well, but yeah, that's, that's going to do it. It's 20 ish minutes and, uh, probably won't be cutting anything out. So yeah. Um, I don't know when you actually saw this. If you saw this in April-ish, uh, before the Swiss wine thing, please make sure you go check out my documentary, Titans of Twiga. Twiga is the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association. Last year in 20, 2022, I sat down with 14 different past presidents of the organization, and we got uh, some history of the organization and of Texas wine in general. Um, you should watch it if you wanna know more about the history of Texas wine, and specifically what the organization Twiga has been able to do for the industry. I highly suggest you watch it. It's an hour and 15 minutes long. It's a legit movie. And uh, it was premiered on March 24th of this year on YouTube. So um, we, we showed it at the Twiga conference this year and a lot of people really liked it. So I decided to make it public right now, try to get some traction on it, see if some people like it. I like it, I hope you like it. So please check it out. And uh, that's gonna do it. We're gonna go back to the Riesling to finish it off. Cheers.